guys, welcome to Telling the Told and Untold. My name is Tsuhu. Before we go straight into today's case, I just give you guys a couple of content warnings. In this video, we do talk about suicide and domestic abuse. I don't go into any detail, but still, if that's not something you think you're interested in watching, then this video probably isn't for you. So maybe you can watch some of my other videos or just wait for my next upload. Jason Droeder was born on the 10th of January 1969 in Buckingham in the UK. When he was three years old, his family decided to move to South Africa. And a couple of years after that, when he was five years old, his parents unfortunately separated and then his dad moved back to the UK and it was also around the same time when his mom met another man his name was Peter Rueda and then he took on his stepfather's surname and um, there's no like clear way of saying his surname like I don't know how to say it I tried to find different sources but different people say different things like Rueda or Rode or Rhoda so I'm just gonna say Rueda for like the rest of the video we don't know much about Jason's childhood. What we do know though is that he was really close to his grandmother and when he was younger his grandmother was involved in a car accident and after this she became a person with a disability and then when he was eight years old she unfortunately passed away. He continued his primary schooling and high schooling and eventually he did matriculate and then he went into the National Army for his compulsory service and it was during this period of his life when he completed a junior leaders course and this was in 1988 and then the following year he met Susan Holmes at a party when she was 19 years old so let me quickly tell you guys about Susan. Susan Holmes who would later become Susan Droda was also born in 1969 but she was born in South Africa. Her parents were pretty well off and because of this she just had a really good upbringing she went to Bryanston High School and Susan was described as someone who was very kind everyone loved her but she was also like a perfectionist she was always prim and proper she excelled both in her schooling as well as in her sports and she has two siblings she has a brother Mark as well as a sister Angela. Her family soon moved to the US. I'm not too sure if Angela and Mark moved with the parents but Susan did move with them and while she was in the States this is when she got her degree in psychology. She was back in South Africa when she met Jason at a party and after this she told her sister that she didn't want to go back to the States. She loved being in SA and just loved how things were going so they told their parents and their parents got the two sisters does a flat and then she and Jason like continued their relationship and they continued their relationship for about four years when in 1993 they decided to get married. It was also during their relationship when Jason enrolled for a law degree at UNISA but he eventually just decided to drop out and then he worked for a furniture upholstery business before joining an insurance company as a clerk. Around the same time that Jason and Susan got married her parents were still in the US but they were planning on immigrating to Australia so different sources say different things some sources say that um, Susan and Jason also decided to move to Australia when her parents were moving to Australia because Jason had dual citizenship in South Africa and Australia but I don't know how because he was born in the UK so I don't know about that and then other sources say that the reason why they moved to Australia in 1993 was because this was during a time when there was political unrest in South Africa and you know the following year 1994 we all know that South Africa became like the democratic South Africa that we know of today so Susan's parents just they weren't sure where South Africa was heading and they just wanted Susan and Jason to go to a country that was more stable. Um, so that's why they decided to move to Australia. But anyways, they moved to Australia and they stayed there for a couple of years. And whilst they were there, this is when Jason um, joined a real estate company. Jason really missed home so he wanted to return to South Africa and Susan was really reluctant but then she just decided to follow her husband and then in 1996 after being in Australia for four years they moved back to South Africa and once they were back in South Africa Jason started a property portfolio and he bought various properties 
and he and Susan would renovate them and they would sell them or sometimes rent them. I'm not too sure when Susan became a teacher, but then after she became a teacher and her and Jason started this company, she just focused more on like her love for interior design. So that's what was happening. And during this time, they also decided that they wanted to start a family, but Susan really struggled getting pregnant. So she had a couple of fertility treatments, which were successful and and then she gave birth to their eldest daughter, Catherine, who they call Kate. And two years later, she had twin daughters, Josie and Alex. Life for the Rueda family was going really well. And then in 2005, Jason joined the Lee Giffen and Sotheby International Royalty Group in 2005. And five years later, in 2010, he became the CEO. And you know, they were making a lot of money. Things were going good in Jason and Susan's relationship. Relationship. Jason would like to say that in their relationship, Susan was the type of person to handle confrontation head on whilst he was the kind of person to shy away from it. And just like all other relationships, they did have their ups and downs. Their, in their marriage, there wasn't any physical violence and Susan would later corroborate this. Um, but their arguments would sometimes just be very aggressive. And Susan also said that Jason was quite jealous of her and he also had like a volatile temper, but he was gentle and kind most of the time. He was sensitive about being criticized and would lose his temper he would lose his temper pretty quickly. Also in the beginning of their marriage, I'm not too sure when, um, but they did start going to marriage counseling and it kind of just helped them improve their marriage so much so that Jason one day just got a tattoo of Susan's name. I'm not too sure where it is on his body, but he did have a tattoo of Susan's name. In 2016, Jason and Susan had been married for 23 years and they lived in Bryanston in Johannesburg and they lived in a 10 million rand house. It's so beautiful. I'll put like a picture of it so you guys can see it. And at this point, their twin daughters, Josie and Alex, were 16 and their eldest daughter, Kate, was 18 years old and she was in matric grade 12. Susan and Jason were also just having a good, like their marriage was just going well, like their lives were going well they were well liked by all their friends you know their family they would host them and by all accounts Susan seemed like a super mom and she just had everything done and she just always looked put together like she was the type of person where when you would look at her she would just look like everything would just look like every oh sorry <laughs> everything would look like it was okay like everything looked like it was perfect and you would just wonder like you'd think that she has more hours in the day than you have. Like you'd be like, oh, I have 24 hours in the day, but Susan looks like she has like 50 hours in the day. The way that she just gets everything done and she's just always perfect, you know? But things wouldn't last because on the 28th of February, 2016, Jason had just returned from Cape Town. He was there on a business trip. So Susan was unpacking his travel bag and this is when she came across a Valentine's Day card that was addressed to Jason from a Jolene Altus guy. So she went, like she read this Valentine's Day card and it was pretty clear that Jason had been having an affair. So immediately she confronted Jason and then she pushed them into their ensuite in suite bathroom so that they would be away from the girls and the girls wouldn't hear them like arguing or having this conversation about Jason having an affair. So she confronted Jason, she asked him like all the details like how it started, when it started, if it's true. And then she forced Jason to call Jolene on the spot, put his phone on speaker and break up with her there and then, which Jason did. It turned out that Jason and Jolene had started their affair in June 2015, so a couple of months earlier. And by all accounts, um, not all accounts, but like some accounts, Jolene was like the complete opposite of Susan. She had dark brown hair while Susan had blonde hair. She was 10 years younger. She also worked in real estate. She actually worked um, at Law Giffen with um, or Swarthby. 
I don't know how to pronounce it, I'm so sorry, but she worked there and obviously Jason was the CEO. So, you know, there's also power dynamics at play in this relationship that Jason had, but we're not there. After this confrontation and Susan forcing Jason to break up with Jolene, she kept his phone for a couple of days and she would just kind of like read his messages with Jolene and when Jolene would text Jason, she would act like she was Jason and there was this one time where Jolene said that she wanted to send Jason a letter and then um, Susan acted like she was Jason and then, you know, said, uh, gave Jolene an email address so that she could send this letter to Jason. Um, I'm not too sure what the letter said. I couldn't find that anywhere, but that's what happened. And soon after this, Jason had his phone back and then randomly Susan called Jason and she was like, I'm on a plane and I'm going to Cape Town to go confront Jolene at the office. And then she flew down to Cape Town and when she got there, she called Jason and she just wanted to know all the details about Jason and Jolene's relationship. Jason would later say that the reason why he was so like forthcoming with all the details that Susan wanted was because he was focused more on like his professional life more than like his personal life and his marriage he was like imagine my wife going to the Cape Town office and confronting my girlfriend like imagine how that would look for me as the CEO so when Susan wanted all these like details about where they had been how they spent the time all the restaurants they went to the sightseeing they did Jason just gave her all this information and Susan later went to all of these different locations and then the next day she was back on the plane back to Joburg and she just told Jason that she didn't go through with it and she didn't confront Jolene. It was really clear that Susan was hurt by Jason's infidelities um, and there are some messages that she sent him and there's one where she said I hope you and she rot in hell together and another one she said I'm sick of that controlling be my life you let that be into my life and I'm taking her out you two a-holes think you can control what I do what I know while she carry on like if twits whenever you want to despite this it did also appear like they really wanted to work on their marriage both Jason and Jolie the two of them started going to marriage counseling once again and Jason had his own individual counseling and it was also during their marriage counseling where their therapist um, could sense or could tell that Susan was really agitated so she suggested that Susan start going to her own individual counseling too and find like her own therapist and Susan listened and then in May 2016 so about three months after she found out about Jolene and Jason she she started going to therapy. During her therapy sessions, Susan would basically just discuss her family dynamics, her relationships with different friends and family members. She also spoke about her and Jason's affair and she told her therapist how 10 years earlier when she was like 35 years old, she discovered that her father had had an extramarital affair and how devastating it was to her. And then she spoke about how her parents still remain together and they seem to be having a better a relationship which could probably also explain why she wanted to work on her relationship with Jason because she saw how her parents worked on her dad's infidelities sorry that was so scary Susan didn't tell anyone about Jason's affair she didn't tell her parents her siblings her friends and it was also clear during Susan's therapy sessions that she was battling to cope with the fact that Jason had lied to her and it seemed as though this affair with Jolene had been both emotional and sexual Susan also said that after he ended his relationship with Jolene Jason just became quite aggressive just about the way that he wanted them to move forward in their marriage but she also denied that Jason was ever violent towards her in their marriage. He was just really mean with his words and they just had really like strong arguments, verbal arguments. She also said that Jason was, she felt like Jason was irritated about her constantly asking him about his affair. Like she just really wanted like all the minute details and Jason was just getting super irritated by her asking all these things and she just also started feeling really 
anxious when you have to travel for work because obviously one of those travel destinations is in Cape Town where Jolene lived and worked and even if she or when she expressed these things to Jason, Jason just really couldn't be bothered about all her anxieties about him working and traveling. During her therapy sessions, they spoke about the affair, including Susan's struggles to overcome um, Jason's infidelity and just how to manage her hurt and anguish. And Susan also couldn't help but draw parallels between her experience and her father's affair. And she also shared that she had once contacted Jolene and told Jolene to leave Jason alone. She would also constantly go through Jason's phone to see whether he was still in contact with Jolene and she she forced him to del delete Jolene's number and she just like kind of make sure that they weren't talking and he was really being honest about this affair having ended. She also believed that Jolene was really invested in Jason and wanted the relationship that she had with, with Jason just for herself but more than anything throughout like all her therapy sessions what Susan wanted was just for her to be over this affair and how much it's hurt her. She just felt like after she found out about the affair, everything in her life had been turned upside down upside down and she just wanted to better handle her anger. She also felt like she was losing her mind and the things that she thought were true and not true she just couldn't differentiate between the two. So she just really wanted to work on her marriage and herself to just be a better person and just hope that their relationship would work out, their marriage would work out. In July Jason was in Cape Town for work and there was a day where he met up with Joe Jolene and Jolene's son and the three of them were just out for coffee or lunch and then they were later joined by another worker that worked at Sotheby's. Um, it's clear that Susan did not know about this meeting based on what she said a couple of days later and it seemed as though she really believed that Jason and Jolene's affair had ended. She sent Jason a message and she just said thanks for picking us over that HW word and thanks for cutting her out completely. I so appreciate you never speaking to her again. I knew that you could turn your life around and you have shown me that you can. Which is just so sad if you think about the fact that this man was really was literally out for lunch with his girlfriend and his girlfriend's daughter. So like we don't know if it was for work, if it was like their personal lives, you know, just going out for lunch. But it's clear that Susan wouldn't have been happy that Jason was out with Jolene and he still did it. That same month, the annual conference for the Lee Giffen and Sotheby's International Realty was coming up and it was going to take place over the weekend um, between the 22nd to the 24th of July 2016. It was being hosted at Spear Hotel, which is in Stellenbosch, um, about an hour away from Cape Town in the Western Cape and it's like this beautiful four-star hotel and with this conference coming up Susan was feeling really anxious about it and she was starting to be suspicious of Jason and Jolene again she really thought that the two of them were seeing each other and in the last session that she had with her psychologist the two of them discussed how Susan was going to move forward if she found out that Jason and Jolene were having this affair and she said that if she found out the two of them were having this affair because she planned on going to the conference then she was just going to leave right there and then and go to her sister's house um, and this is because her sister and her sister's husband so um, Susan's brother-in-law they lived relatively close to Spear Hotel I'm not too sure if they lived in Stellenbosch or if they lived in Cape Town or if they lived between Cape Town and Stellenbosch but they lived relatively close to Spear Hotel so she was just like you know if I find out that Jason and Shalene are still seeing each other then I'm just gonna go to my sister's and it was just very conven a convenient place for her to go to you know if things happened at the conference. There was a rule that spouses weren't allowed going to the conference but Susan was still adamant that she was going despite this rule and Jason is the CEO or was the CEO um, so she was like 
I really don't care. Also, if he's the CEO, there's not much consequences that he will face if he did bring her. The two of them also spoke about it during one of their marriage counseling sessions and their therapist tried to mediate and telling Susan that she didn't think that it was a good idea. But Susan was so adamant on going and because of this, Jason literally just like stormed out of the session because he was just so upset and annoyed. Leading up to the conference, Susan was like just getting ready like physically. She went to get Botox. This wasn't her first Botox session. Her first Botox session I think was in February 2014, so like two years earlier. But when she went to her doctor to get this Botox, she just told her doctor like, you know what, just a lot of things have been happening since February, but she didn't want to talk about it. And then she said, and I could make me pretty. She also got her hair dyed, she bought new clothes, and and this was because she was going to come face to face with Jolene. Jolene worked for this company and obviously she was going to be there. So she was like, I'm going to come face to face with potentially my husband's girlfriend, ex-girlfriend. So yeah. Jason and Susan then went to the conference and we don't know what happened on the 22nd of July, but we can just assume that it was uneventful because there hasn't been any information about that day. And then on the 23rd of July, whatever happens at a conference was happening. Susan was enjoying her weekend, you know, on the wine farm. She had been drinking all day. And then that night there was a dinner with all the conference attendees. And then after this, there was like a bit of dancing. People were just enjoying themselves and then Jason wanted to go to one of the suites for an after party but Susan just wasn't in the mood and she just said that they should go back to their room which they did and I think it's around the same time when Susan sent her therapist a message on whatsapp so after her last session with her therapist her therapist said that okay when you go to Stellenbosch for this conference just feel free to send me a message anytime whenever you want you know just to let me know how you're feeling and Susan did just this so at around 8 p.m she sent her therapist a message and she said I shook her hand and said I hoped we didn't have to meet again her psychologist replies did it leave you feeling in control? Susan replied, yes. And then her psychologist said, great, see you. To so tomorrow will be better. Have a good night. And Susan just never read this message. So after Jason and Susan returned to their room, Jason then went into the bathroom. And whilst he was in the bathroom, he tried sending Jolene a message and basically just letting her know that he wouldn't be able to make it to the after of the party because Susan wanted him in the bedroom. And then Susan walked into the bathroom Room, and she literally caught him doing this and after this the two of them started arguing like it was a big fight between the two of them because it's like why are you messaging Jolene about Gina being able to go to the after after party you know so the two of them started arguing and this is when Jason decided that you know what he was going to this after after party despite what Susan said and as he was heading out of the room to head downstairs to this party Susan just got into his way and then he said that he grabbed her by her bathrobe and tried to pull her out of the way and then he took his right hand and grabbed her neck and then literally just like pushed her out of the way. Susan then tried to stop him by grabbing his collar and then he swung around and hit her face with the back of his hand. He then stormed out of the room and Susan just followed him and she was still in her gown. Jason went to one room where Jolene and two other workers were but these workers didn't know that Jolene and Jason were seeing each other. So he got into the room and he just sat on the bed and he was silent. So they all just kind of looked at him like oh you know like what are you doing here and he just you know just breathing heavily like you could tell that he was mad but he just didn't say anything and then after a couple of seconds or minutes Susan walked in and she was also silent but she just kind of looked at Jason like you know like it's time to go and he looked at her they were just looking at each other mind you the workers are there like looking at them like what's happening and he's looking at his wife she's looking at him and then she put her hands on her hips that kind of like being stern like let's go and then he got up and then they were walking back to their hotel room so this so like Spear Hotel isn't like other hotels like you know when a hotel is just like a huge building and it's just like different hotel rooms so it's just like different rooms 
that are like spread apart so sometimes you go to one room you have to walk through like a pathway so they were walking on the pathway back to their hotel room and the two of them were still arguing at this point they were shouting at each other and then afterwards Jason said that he like elbowed Susan in the nose and then she fell to the ground and she scraped her knee as well as her head on like this wall it was like a half wall and then afterwards she managed to get up and then they walked to their hotel room and then they just continued arguing and then Jason started screaming at Susan and he just said you know what I'm done I'm done with you I'm done with this marriage and then he said that he wanted a divorce and that they would discuss everything once they went back home to Joburg he said after this the two of them just got into bed and then they just went to sleep and then the next day Susan woke up at around 7 a.m. and he felt her moving and then she woke up and he heard her going to the bathroom he then just kind of turned over and then he went back to bed and then he woke up a couple of I think like minutes later and he wanted to get ready for the day because this was the last day of the conference so he woke up and then he went to the bathroom so that he could get ready for the day and as he tried opening the bathroom door it was locked so he started calling for Susan's name but Susan wasn't replying and then just started getting mad so he was like Susan Susan like you know open the door open the door and she wasn't opening the door then he got his phone he's tried calling Susan's phone and he could hear it ringing from the other side like of the door so he could like he knew that Susan was in the bathroom but she still wasn't replying and then he just like kept banging on the door and Susan still wouldn't open the bathroom door this is when he decided to call reception this was just like around 8 or just after 8 in the morning so an hour after Susan had gotten up and went to the bathroom so he called reception and he asked for a maintenance man and he just told them that the door to the bathroom had been locked from the inside and he wasn't able to get inside of the bathroom but he didn't tell them that Susan his wife was in the bathroom at this point so then the receptionist called the maintenance man and his name is Desmond he is going to play a big part in this so Desmond Desmond Daniels um, he answered this call at around quarter past eight and then he went to room 221 at the Sphere Hotel and he knocked on the door and then Jason went let him inside and he had the screwdriver so he went to the bathroom door and he started unscrewing it and eventually he got the door open so according to Jason he tried opening the bathroom door and then as he was opening the door it felt like something was blocking it and then he looked down and he saw Susan's feet so he was like okay her legs are blocking the door that's why I can't get it open so he just tried like pushing it a bit more he managed to open it a bit and then he kind of like squeezed himself into the bathroom and this is when he saw Susan she was Still dressed in her bathroom she was half hanging and half crouched against the bathroom door and there was a cord of her straightener iron wrapped tightly around her neck and tied to the end of the hook at the back of the door he then tried to lift her and then he called Desmond to come into the bathroom and then Desmond walked into the bathroom and they just managed to lift her off the door and place her on the ground and then Jason said he started administering CPR and this is when Desmond ran out of the room to go get help but according to Desmond, after he managed to unlock the bathroom door, he's the one that walked in first. And when he walked first into the bathroom, there were no issues. Like he just opened the door like normally. And once he opened the door, this is when he saw Susan lying down on the ground and she was completely naked. And the straight snow cord was wrapped around her neck, but it was wrapped really loosely. Like it wasn't wrapped as tightly as Jason said it had been wrapped. So as all of this is happening, I'm going to introduce someone else and his name is Mark Thompson. So Mark had known Jason for seven years at this point and he also worked at Sotheby's and he was at the conference. So in the morning at around half past eight, he was having breakfast at like the breakfast room and he was just talking to other people that were at the hotel, other people that were attending the conference. And then one of the people attending the conference walked in and they were like something happened there's something going on in one of the hotel rooms so because mark thought that it had something to do with someone that was attending the conference he got up and he went to go see what was going on 
He then walked to room 221 and then he saw staff members standing outside the hotel room door and then he walked inside and once he walked inside this hotel room, he saw Jason sitting next to Susan's body and he saw Mark walk in and he was like, he just shouted, Mark, help me. So Mark just immediately went to Jason and went to Susan and he like laid down and he just like didn't know what to do so he was like you know what let me just try give her CPR so Mark started giving CPR to Susan and he would later find out that he wasn't even doing it properly so when you give CPR like you like you know you like on the chest and then you hold their nose and then breathe into their mouth and then continue that but he didn't ever like block her nose so he would just like pump her chest and then blow into her mouth and then continue and he gave Susan CPR for about 30 to 45 minutes but he immediately knew that she was dead because he said as soon as he touched her she was called to the touch but he still kept trying to do this because Jason kept shouting Mark help me Mark help me so he kept trying to give Susan CPR and as he was giving Susan CPR he just noticed a couple of things that were just weird or like unsettling. He noticed that Susan was completely naked as he was giving her CPR. And then there were just also other questions running through his mind, you know? He was like, why is she naked? Why is there a cord tied around her neck? Why is it so loose? It was like flimsy. And how would it hold her body if she was hanging from it? Why is there still such a small single knot in the cord? And why why is Jason not saying anything to Susan like Jason wasn't saying like oh Susan wake up you know anything like that it was just Mark help me Mark help me nothing directed towards Susan he also noticed that Susan had a giant bruise on the inside of her thigh he noticed that there was like small stool next to her body as well as like a small puddle of urine by her buttocks and at this point he was still get like he was getting tired of giving her CPR and and this is when a woman walked into the bathroom she saw what was happening and then she was like you know she was just being i want to say christian -y. is that i'm a christian too you know but she was like i declare your cpr working in the name of jesus you know just like say those things so that susan wake up and then mark was just so tired of giving cpr now this woman is coming and like praying and shouting things so he just looked at her he was like please go pray outside i'm busy and around this point he just also got really tired so he just could tell that his cpr wasn't working i forgot to mention that as he was giving cpr Susan's nose would start bleeding. It bled about three times. So each time it would bleed, he would stop CPR, get a tissue, wipe her nose, stop CPR, and it would bleed again, you know, and he did that three times. So as he got tired from giving Susan CPR, he just quietly sat next to Jason and just, you know, just held his hand and they just sat there in silence. And this is when a woman came with a red blanket and just covered Susan's body. Because remember, Mark said that she was naked. And after this, um, paramedics eventually arrived at Spear Hotel and they did declare Susan dead. And then at around 10 a.m., so this is three hours after Jason said that Susan had woken up and went to the bathroom, Jason called Susan's parents and he told them that Susan had taken her own life. And her parents were so confused on the phone, like they started crying, they were screaming, they were just trying to understand what was happening. And I think it's also around the same time when Jason called his three daughters to let them know that their mother had passed away. And some people questioned why he decided to like call them instead of maybe waiting until he got home. But other people say it's because he didn't want them finding out over like, you know, maybe like news articles, social media, just things like that. So he just wanted them to hear it from him instead of them finding out from other people. So remember I said that Susan's sister and Susan's brother-in-law lived relatively close to Spear Hotel. So after they got the phone call that Susan had taken her own life, um, Peter, which is Susan's brother-in-law and Jason's like 
brother-in-law too he immediately got into the car he drove down to spear hotel and he searched for room 221 and he got there and once he got inside the room he kind of just held jason's hand quietly and he notices that jason just looked completely broken and devastated but he also noted that jason appeared like neatly shaven and he was dressed which is weird because he said that he was still sleeping when Susan went to the bathroom and then she locked the door. So how are you like neatly shaven and like, you know, like you're clean. Like when did you get time to shower if you were sleeping before everything transpired, you know? And also at this point, some of Susan's family members arrived at Spear Hotel. And I assume it's because just like Peter, they lived near Stellenbosch, maybe they lived in Cape Town. One of these family members was Susan's dad. His name is Neville. He also arrived at Spear Hotel and he got into the room and then he was there when police also arrived and took Jason's statement. And I don't know, maybe he was a bit suspicious of Jason because afterwards he asked Jason what happened and then he asked to look at Jason's hands. So he took Jason's hands and he looked at them, at, you know, like looked at them like this and then looked at them like this. I think maybe trying to see if there were any marks on his hands but that's what happened and then later that night jason flew down to joburg and then once he got home he just climbed into one of his daughter's beds and he was curled up in a fetal position and then he was just like silent and just like moaning but didn't say anything and his mom was also there and his daughters were there too and they were just kind of comforting him susan's mom was also there so she witnessed all of this happening Two days after Susan passed away, her brother Mark called Jason. He was living in Australia at the time. I think he's still there. So he was living in Australia. So he hadn't been able to like, you know, get his flights back to South Africa and stuff. So he called Jason up and he had known Jason for 27 years at this point. You know, like this is his sister's husband, you know, and they've been together for so long. So he knew this man. So the first call, he kind of called Jason, ended quite quickly and then the next day he called Jason again and this time he said that Jason was like so emotional over the phone he could barely hear what he was saying but there was a point where Jason said I killed her I killed her I killed her like three times and he didn't think it was suspicious or didn't think that Jason was like admitting to the fact that he had killed Jason he just thought it was Jason saying this because Susan had taken her own life and he kind of felt guilty about it so he was like no don't worry like you didn't do anything you didn't kill her you know your family loves you Susan's family loves you like we all love you everything's going to be okay a few days later Jason was called down back to Cape Town by police because they wanted to interview him and ask him some questions and as this was happening there was just like a sense of concern and mild panic in the air there were also rumors about Jason having had an affair and once he returned back to Joburg he called a family meeting and he sat everyone down like his family Susan's family his daughters and he was like you know what I have been having an affair and everyone was so shocked like they just couldn't believe that this man was having an affair you know and Susan knew about it too but then he was like on his daughter's lives he did not kill Susan with his bare hands he was like I might have killed her emotionally but I didn't kill her with my own hands and that was that and then soon Susan was laid to rest and it said that after the ceremony ended Jason and his three daughters left like they didn't stay for like you know when you have like tea and coffee and some people have like lunch after the funeral they didn't stay for that they just immediately went home they weren't even there when they released pink and white balloons in memory of Susan and Susan's mother says that that is so like Susan like Susan's the type of person to like you know release balloons for like someone so like it's beautiful and stuff they didn't stay for that they also had a private cremation ceremony for susan and jason did not attend that two weeks after susan passed away news broke that there was still a mystery to susan's death and this was because police had initially ruled her death a suicide but then they changed that to a homicide after they got the results back from her autopsy 
and then like a week and a half after that Jason Derrida was arrested in Bryanston on suspicion of murdering his wife Susan and he was also facing facing an additional charge of obstruction of justice and he appeared in the Randwick Magistrates Court in Johannesburg after this he was taken back to Stellenbosch so that he could attend trial there because that's where the murder took place and you won't believe who was defending him. His lawyer was Francois Van Sale and this is the same man who successfully defended Sharon Devani who was accused of murdering his wife Annie Devani whilst they were honeymooning in Cape Town. I have covered that case if you haven't watched it I'll link it up. I think it's here. I'll link it up so you can watch that case but you know he had a really good defense attorney so the trial eventually started and there was a lot of evidence the first one was phone evidence like phone call evidence as well as whatsapp messages and it turned out that between february and july 2016 jason and jolene had called each other over 2200 times they called each other 2266 times to be exact and my maths isn't very good but i tried calculating that and that's like multiple times a day like i think like 15 times a day if my maths is correct don't quote me it's like 15 times a day if you wanna you know put it nicely and then in those same months Jason and Susan spoke on the phone over a thousand times it was a thousand and seven a thousand seven hundred and three times to be exact and that's also a lot that's multiple times a day um so you can say like the phone call differences between the two make sense because Susan was in Joburg and her and Jason lived together and Jolene lived in Cape Town so they had like a long distance relationship but still that's a lot of times to call someone there were also some whatsapp messages between Jason and Jolene from the 23rd of July as well as Jason and Susan from that same day so I'll put them on the screen so you guys can read along with me but if you want you can kind of just like read them by yourselves and just like skip so that you don't stay here for a while so the first messages I'm going to read are between Jason and Jolene so Jason says because I'm frustrated that I can't be with you who I want you still love me this weekend made me realize just how much I don't want to be with Sue anymore. All I can think of is you. I want to scream with frustration. I don't want anything more in my life than to be with you. And then Jolene says, my penguin forever. And Jason says, having you close is driving me crazy. Sue is driving me nuts. She follows me around like a shadow. Then now these are the messages between Susan and Jason. So Jason says, that is not true, Sue. And she says, I know you're going to divorce me, so I'm doing what I want now. You hear and think what you want to. You just go off on a tangent. Do you have the car? I have my briefcase in there. Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. Yes. I need my speech and some notes. When can I get it, please? One hour. Okay. Or are you just checking how much time you have? Oh, for sakes, I'm sitting in a conference with 150 people watching me. You are going to die today, and so is she. Change those numbers on your phone that are blocked to normal numbers now, and not letters. What is your problem? You are a devious bastard. You cannot pack your bag and leave. And take her bloody name off too. Why is she a contact? Because if I call her, it will come up on Siri, you idiot. Now leave. I have had enough. On my work day, you're doing this to me. I want you gone now. I don't care about the consequences. Take it off. I'm not in the conference. I'm in the conference. What the are you calling me for? Thought it was finished. We are finished. Threaten you once more, Jason. You made that choice. What are you doing? Looking for a car. Good for you. Obviously, like... I just didn't want to keep saying like Jason, Susan, Jason, Susan. So I also assume that's like how it sounded like over the phone. Like, you know, their tones. It's so aggressive. Then on July 14th, there were messages that Susan sent to Jolene. And these messages were sent just after 7 a.m., which is a bit strange because you'll see just now that Susan's time of death was said to be like just before 6 a.m. But apparently she sent these messages just after say 
just after 7 a.m so i think earlier that night or like in the early hours jolene sent susan a message and she said go wash your mouth and then susan replied back w wash your own mouth after you suck my husband's Jason said you were only good for one thing and that's why he keeps coming back. He said you would be the last person he ever wanted to be with. And it's also around the same time that Jason received a message from I think his friend or like one of the people that were attending the conference and they just asked are you okay and Jason replied drama but okay. So Susan's cause of death was said to be asphyxiation and strangulation and as I mentioned earlier her time of death was just before 6 a.m. Her time of death was um, 5.40 so 20 to 6 on the 24th of July and remember she was found um, at around quarter past eight, half past eight. So they believe that after Susan fetched Jason from the room that Jolene and the other workers were in, they were fighting like Jason said, but instead of them having slept like his story said, they just continued fighting into the early hours of the morning until Jason was like just became fed up and then eventually snapped and strangled Susan and then staged her body. The defense also had their own pathologist and he says that Susan's time of death is just after 7 a.m. and that her cause of death was strangulation. Um, one of the sources I used were the court documents where you can hear what both pathologists say and how they came to their own conclusions. I'm not going to go into detail because it is a lot but if you do want to read that um, you can go to the description box where I always link all of my sources and it's the first link. So yeah, you can go read that. And then you can also see all the many phone calls that Jason made to Jolene and other people in the early hours of the morning on the 24th of July. I didn't include that here, um, but yeah, you can see those things where they called each other just like a lot when he said he was sleeping. So there were also signs of bowel release and blood in the room indicating that Susan might have died in the room and not in the bathroom where she was found so it is believed that she was moved and staged so sometimes when like obviously like our bodies are full of toxins and gases so when you die like your body releases all those things so they believe that when Jason was strangling Susan like as he was strangling her her body just kind of released like these feces and urine it was involuntary and he tried to clean it up because they found traces of it in the bedroom but remember according to Mark's, Mark Thompson's um, testimony he says that as he was giving her CPR he also saw stool next to Susan's body as well as a puddle of urine so this could just indicate like this could have just happened after she had died. Susan also weighed 53 kilograms which is really tiny but despite her being this small like in body weight they did say that the straightener that was found wrapped around her neck wasn't like couldn't have held all of her weight like she was too heavy for the straightener so if she did try and hang herself with this thing this cord would have snapped. So when they took Susan's body away from room 221 at Spear Hotel, she was in her gown, but her gown was inside out and like, you know, the belt that you wrap around your gown, it was left on the bed. So if we listen or if you focus on Jason's story he says that when he opened the door and like struggled to open it once he got to susan susan was wearing her gown but both desmond and mark say that susan was completely naked so they believe that before paramedics arrived and other people arrived that jason took her gown and like just kind of like put it on her quickly and that's why the gown was inside out and her belt was found in the bedroom and not in the bathroom where her body was Eventually, Jason Droda was found guilty of the murder of his wife, Susan Droda, as well as defeating the ends of justice. And during sentencing, it was discovered that Susan did have life insurance and Jason was a beneficiary and it was going to pay out 2.6 million rand. It's a lot of money. Finally, on the 17th of February 2019, Jason Droda was sentenced to 20 years in prison and at the time of his sentence, his three daughters still stood behind their dad and believed his versions of 
events. Jason also tried to appeal his sentence and as he was waiting for the Supreme Court of Appeal to hear his why he was appealing his conviction and sentencing, he applied for bail. So he was out on bail for about 200,000 rand and there was also a 1 million rand charity lodged with the court register in December 2019. Then on the 7th of December 2021, the Supreme Court of Appeal dismissed an appeal against Jason's high court conviction for murder, but they did, however, reduce his sentence from 20 years to just 15 years. And they said this is because they believe that um, the first judge just made a couple of mistakes during the trial, so that's why they reduced his sentence. So Jason will be released in 2036. Just quickly, I didn't know where to add this, but in May 2020, Jolene Altersky was charged with criminal defamation, alternatively criminal injury, on five accounts as well as contempt of court. And this is because she made some comments on social media as well as text messages where she basically just said that the whole system is corrupt. She said that um, the police were just trying to find a guilty verdict on a successful white businessman and they just wanted to show the country that police could get their jobs done so that's why they convicted jason and that he wasn't guilty she said some wild things she said as far as i'm concerned the state and the judge are the same team and if the state acted unlawfully and eagerly and illegally searching properties and bribing state witnesses what else did they fabricate in order to get their christmas bonus a corrupt country starts with corrupt police. I do hope the truth will be revealed and actual justice served. So after she was charged with all these things, unsurprisingly, she wrote an apology letter to the judge and then, yeah, all those charges against her were withdrawn. Um, today, Jolene is still alive and successful she is still in real estate um jason is still in prison and i don't know where his three daughters are but i hope wherever they are they are thriving in their lives even though they lost both of their parents and i just hope that they just live good and happy lives And yeah, that's it for today's case. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. It really means a lot to me and helps out my channel a lot. And yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.